An Earth Without People by Steve Bursky from Scientific American. What is your purpose for reading? An Earth Without People. A new way to examine humanity's impact on the environment is to consider how the world would fare, how the world would do, how it would fare, if all of the people disappeared. It's a common fantasy to imagine that you're the last person left alive on Earth. But what if all human beings were suddenly whisked off the planet? That premise is the starting point for The World Without Us, a book by science writer Alan Weissman, an associate professor of journalism at the University of Arizona. In this extended thought experiment, Weissman does not specify exactly what finishes off Homo sapiens people. Instead, he simply assumes the abrupt disappearance of our species and projects the sequence of events that would most likely occur over in the years, decades, and centuries afterward. According to Weissman, large parts of our physical infrastructure, the underlying base or supporting structure, and what we're talking about is uh, economy. We're talking about uh, roads, bridges, buildings, water, infrastructure. Um, our infrastructure would begin to crumble almost immediately. Without street cleaners and road crews, our grand boulevards and superhighways would start to crack and buckle in a matter of months. Over the following decades, you know, decade is 10 years, so decades, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, over the following decades, many houses and office buildings would collapse, but some ordinary items would resist decay, so they wouldn't decay or rot for an extraordinarily long time. Stainless steel pots, for example, could last for millennia thousands of years, especially if they were buried in the weed-covered mounds that used to be our kitchens. And certain common plastics might remain intact for hundreds of thousands of years. They would not break down until microbes evolved the ability to consume them. The circled phrase in line 10 is a cause that would have a number of effects. Science writer Alan Weissman believes this event would cause our infrastructure to begin to crumble almost immediately, underlying two other effects that he describes in the second paragraph. What other effects do you see? Scientific American editor Steve Mursky recently interviewed Weissman to find out why he wrote the book and what lessons can be drawn from his research. Some excerpts, small parts, from that interview appear on the following pages. Q&A with Alan Weissman. If human beings were to disappear tomorrow, the magnificent skyline of Manhattan would not long survive them wouldn't live long past them. Weissman describes how the concrete jungle of New York City would revert to a real forest. Think about how this connects to the story we just read. What would happen if all of our what would happen to all of our stuff if we weren't here anymore? Could nature wipe out all of our traces? Are there some things that we've made that are indestructible or indelible? Could nature, for example, take New York City back to the forest that was there when Henry Hudson first saw it in 1609? 
I had a fascinating time talking to engineers and maintenance people in New York City about what it takes to hold off nature. I discovered that our huge, imposing, overwhelming infrastructures that seem so monumental and indestructible are actually these fairly fragile concepts. Read that sentence with me, please, from here. I discovered that our huge, imposing, overwhelming infrastructures that seem so monumental and indestructible are actually these fairly fragile concepts. Again. I discovered that our huge, imposing, overwhelming infrastructures that seem so monumental and indestructible are actually these fairly fragile concepts. Fragile means easy to break, delicate. They continue to function and exist thanks to a few human beings on whom all of us really depend. The name Manhattan comes from an Indian term referring to hills. It used to be a fairly, a very hilly island. Of course, the region was eventually flattened to have a grid of streets imposed on it. Around those hills, there used to flow about 40 different streams. And there were numerous springs all over Manhattan Island. What happened to all that water? There's still, so, there's still just as much rainfall as ever on Manhattan, but the water has now been suppressed. It's underground. Some of it runs through the sewage system, but a sewage system is never as efficient as nature in wicking away water and taking away water. So there's a lot of groundwater rushing around underneath, trying to get out. Even on a clear, sunny day, the people who keep the subway going have to pump 13 million gallons of water away. Otherwise, the tunnels would start to flood. You see the arrow? Why has there been a need to control water on the island of Manhattan? Circle all that apply. There are places in Manhattan where they're constantly fighting rising underground rivers that are corroding the tracks, destroying the tracks. You stand in these pump rooms and you see an enormous amount of water gushing in. And down there in a little box are these pumps, pumping it away. So say human beings disappeared tomorrow. One of the first things that would happen is that the power would go off. A lot of our power comes out of nuclear or coal-fired plants that have automatic fail-safe switches to make sure that they don't go out of control if no humans are monitoring their systems. Wow. But once the power goes off, the pumps stop working. Once the pumps stop working, the subways start filling with water. Within 48 hours, you're going to have, whoa, a lot of flooding in New York City. Some of this would be visible on the surface, above, above the subways, right? On the ground, the surface. You might have some sewers overflowing. Those sewers would very quickly become clogged with debris, with trash. In the beginning, the innumerable plastic bags that are blowing around the city, and later, if nobody is trimming the hedges in the parks, you're going to have leaf litter clogging up the sewers. You see the arrow? In lines 54 to 69, Weissman describes one event or cause that would set off a cause and effect chain, chain reaction. Complete the chart to show how a cause can lead to an effect which can become the cause of another effect. So the city's power goes off. The pumps stop working. When the pumps stop working, then what happens? Then what happens? Then what happens? Hint. But what would be happening underground? Corrosion. J. 
Just think of the subway lines below Lexington Avenue. You stand there waiting for the train, and there are all of these steel columns that are holding up the roof, which is really the street. These things would start to corrode. They would start to rust and rot out, and eventually collapse. After a while, the streets would begin cratering. Big holes would open up in the streets, which would happen within just a couple of decades, so 20 or 30 years. Pretty soon, some of the streets would revert to the surface rivers that we used to have in Manhattan before we built all of this stuff. Many of the buildings in Manhattan are anchored to bedrock, but even if they had steel beam foundations, these structures were not designed to be waterlogged, full of water. Waterlogged means full of water. They weren't designed to be waterlogged all the time. So eventually, buildings would start to topple and fall. They would collapse. And we're bound to have some more hurricanes hitting the East Coast as climate change gives us more extreme weather. <clears throat> According to his point of view. Okay. A new ecosystem would develop. One factor in this process has been underlined for you. Underline at least two other factors, he suggests, would help a new ecosystem develop. When a building would fall, it would take down a couple of others as it went, creating a clearing. Into those clearings would blow seeds from plants, and those seeds would establish themselves in the cracks in the pavement. They would already be rooting in leaf litter anyway, but the addition of lime from powdered concrete would create a less acidic environment for various species. A city would start to develop its own little ecosystem. Every spring when the temperature would be hovering on one side or the other freezing, new cracks would appear. Water would go down into the cracks and freeze. The cracks would widen and seeds would blow in there. It would happen very quickly. How would the Earth's ecosystems change if human beings were out of the picture? Weissman says we can, we can get a glimpse of this hypothetical world by looking at a primeval, by looking at primeval pockets where humanity's footprint has been lightest. Primeval is, is another way to say ancient. Little places in the world where there have been very few people. To see how the world would look if humans were gone, I began going to abandoned places, places that people had left for different reasons. One of them is the last fragment of primeval forest in Europe. It's like what you see in your mind's eye when you're a kid and someone is reading Grimm's fairy tales to you. A dark, brooding forest with wolves howling and tons of moss hanging off the trees. And there is such a place. It still exists on the border between Poland and Belarus. It was a game reserve that was set aside in the 1300s by a Lithuanian duke who later became king of Poland. A series of Polish kings and then Russian czars kept it as their own private hunting ground. There was very little human impact. After World War II, it became a national park. You can go in there and you see these enormous trees. It doesn't feel strange. It feels almost right. I'm sorry, it almost feels right. Like something feels complete in there. You see oaks and ashes nearly 150 feet tall and 10 feet in diameter with bark furrows so deep that woodpeckers stuff pine cones in them. Besides wolves and elk, the forest is home to the last remaining wild herd of bison bonasas, the native European buffalo. Visualize. Weissman describes the primeval forest of Europe. Underline descriptive words and phrases that he uses. Okay. The oaks and the ashes, all of this stuff. Okay. Reread the underlined sentence in 128. Oh, we're not there yet. Let me get there. Okay. 
I also went to the Korean DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. Here you have this little stretch of land. It's about 150 miles long and two and a half miles wide that has two of the world's biggest armies facing off against each other. And in between the armies is an inadvertent, like accidental, inadvertent wildlife preserve. Because the people can't go there, they're declaring war on the other side. So there's no people in this little middle stretch. So it's an inadvertent wildlife preserve, accidental. You see species that might be extinct if it weren't for this one little piece of land. Sometimes you'll hear the soldiers screaming at one another through loudspeakers or flashing their propaganda back and forth. And in the middle of all this tension, you'll see the flocks of cranes, the birds, cranes, that winter there. <laughs> but to really understand a world without humans, I realized I would have to learn what the world was like before humans evolved. He's a scientist, that's what he thinks. So I went to Africa, the place where humans arose, and the only continent where there are still huge animals roaming around. We used to have huge animals on all the other continents and on many of the islands. We had enormous creatures in North and South America, giant sloths that were even bigger than the mammoths, beavers the size of bears. It's controversial as to what actually wiped them out, but a lot of indications point the finger at us. The extinctions on each landmass seem to coincide with the arrival of humans. But Africa is the place where human beings and animals evolved together, and the animals there learned strategies to avoid our predation. In other words, hunting, predation. Without humans... North America would probably become a giant deer habitat in the near term. As forests would become reestablished across the continent, eventually, in evolutionary time, larger herbivores would evolve to take advantage of all the nutrients locked up in woody species. Larger predators would evolve accordingly. Okay. So reread the underlined sentence in 128 and 129, right here. Then complete the organizer to show or restate the ideas in this sentence as a cause and effect relationship. Humans arrived and what happened? Specialized vocabulary. One of the ways that scientists classify animals is according to what they eat. Some animals eat only meat, some only plants, some both. Look at the word herbivore in line 133. As you analyze the meaning to determine, as you analyze the word to determine its meaning, look for parts of the word that look familiar. Complete one of the phrases below to Check one of the phrases below to complete the following sentence. An herbivore eats only plants, only animals, plants and animals. Write the part of the word herbivore that helps you figure it out. I'm sure you've got that. Thinking about an earth without humans can have practical benefits. Weissman explains that his approach can shed new light on environmental problems. I'm not suggesting we have to worry about human beings suddenly disappearing tomorrow, some alien death ray taking us all away. On the contrary, what I'm finding is that with this way of looking at our planet, by theoretically just removing us, it turns out to be so fascinating that it kind of disarms people's fears or the terrible wave of depression that can engulf us when we read about the environmental problems that we have created and the possible disasters we may be facing in the future. Because frankly, whenever we read about those things, our concern is, oh my God, are we going to die? Is this going to be the end? My book eliminates that concern right at the beginning by saying the end has already taken place. For whatever reason, human beings are gone. And now we get to sit back and see what happens in our absence. 
it's a delicious little way of reducing all of the fear and anxiety. And looking at what would happen in our absence is another way of looking at, well, what goes on in our presence, like what people are doing to the earth. For example, think about how long it would take to wipe out some of the things we have created. Some of our more formidable inventions have a longevity that we can't even predict yet, like some of the persistent organic pollutants that began as pesticides or industrial chemicals. Or some of our plastics, which have an enormous role in our lives and an enormous presence in the environment. And nearly all of these things weren't even here until after World War II. You begin to think there's probably no way we are going to have any kind of positive outcome, that we're looking at an overwhelming tide of geologic proportions that the human race has loosed on the earth. I raise one possibility toward the end of the book that humans can continue to be a part of the ecosystem in a way that is much more in balance with the rest of the planet. It's something that I approach by first looking at not just the horrible things that have created what, what are so frightening, such as our radioactivity and pollutants, some of which may be around until the end of the planet, but also some of the beautiful things that we have done. I raise the question, would it be a sad loss if humanity was extirpated, pulled up by the roots, destroyed, eliminated, extirpated? Wouldn't it be a sad loss if humanity was extirpated from the planet? What about our greatest acts of art and expression, our most beautiful sculpture, our finest architecture? Will there be any signs of us at all that would indicate that we were here at one point? This is the second reaction I always get from people. At first they think, the world would be beautiful without us. But then they think, wouldn't it be sad not to have us here? And I don't think it's necessary for, for us to all disappear for the earth to come back to a healthier state. In lines 153 to 168, Weissman suggests that fairly recent innovations such as plastics and industrial chemicals... When a question refers to specific lines, it's a signal that you should return to the text to determine the best answer. And then when you get there, you skim and scan. So let's find that 153 to 168. Okay. 153 starts here. Longevity. Okay. How long it would take to wipe out some of the things we've created? The longevity is hard to predict. So what are we talking about? Okay, those things may last as long as the earth itself, especially the chemicals. Okay, and here's a visual timeline for what we just read okay with some more details so two days after the human beings are gone the flood is what happened the New York City subway system would flood a year later two to four five eight ten okay take a moment and go through how long would it take 10 million years bronze sculptures such as this Buddha would still survive. 